There are more images of Queen Elizabeth II than any other person in history. Many of them provoked strong emotions when they were first unveiled. I thought maybe it's going to ruin my career. He was really just concentrating on getting this right for this time. If you had portrayed Elizabeth in the first in this way, or Mary Tudor, you would have been executed. Mm. The royal portrait is one of the most powerful propaganda tools a monarch possesses. Images of regal power, dominance, and the divine right to rule. That's all very well if you're a king, but if you're a queen, it gets a lot more complicated. I'm going to discover how artists through history have grappled with painting a woman in power and what that tells us about our changing attitudes to female monarchy. This is where you get excited every time again and again to be a historian. Are you excited to be a historian at the moment? Well, I am, but I don't know what I'm going to see. How can a queen be a terrifying ruler in an ageing female body? When you've seen photos of her, you can't really knock just a few years off her age. We can't have this airbrushing going on anymore. And how can she ever command the same respect as a king? Look at her. She's a monster with snakes in her hair and her breasts are long, sagging, withered, like, like others. Throughout history, artists had to summon all of their creativity and skill to strike that complex balance between femininity and power. In order to paint a queen, artists had to reinvent the very idea of painting a woman. In case you hadn't noticed, it's the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. To mark it, the National Portrait Gallery show The Queen Art and Image has been touring the country. It celebrates the diverse portraiture of the last 60 years. The most famous and controversial of them all is barely the size of a postcard. Freud was famous for never ever flattering his sitters, and here he really goes out of his way to avoid accusations of pandering to royalty. We see this burly, quite dumpy, hangdog monarch with what appears to be a five o'clock shadow darkening her thick jaw. This could be a granny with a perm just about to pop out for a pint of milk. The process. This is fantastic, just immediately to give a sense of... The painter and photographer David Dawson was Lucian Freud's assistant for two decades until the artist's death last year. How do you feel when you're leafing through? I mean, it must still be It's quite poignant, painful. yeah. It's, um, it's a good visual diary for me. Um, in Damien. Very entertaining. And is this the dog that you're sitting in yeah, front of? This, yes, look, Eli posing. <laughs> <laughs> See? There he is. <laughs> How wonderful. <laughs> In 1999, Freud received some news. The Queen wanted to sit for him. There's this photo before the Queen arrived. Dawson was given permission to document part of the process, which took place over 18 two-hour sittings. For Freud, whose portraits could often take years, it wasn't long. Quite often with Lucian, when he's working in the studio, he has two or three attempts. So he was really concentrating on getting this right first time. It all began splendidly. He sort of started around the forehead and, and around her eyes. And it, it sort of, and his, at least when he painted, would work in small areas and then build outwards. Well, he'd make that so, bit quite finished. Yeah, and then... yeah, and then it would just grow. It was a very unusual way of painting. It, yeah, it is. It was fascinating to watch. But not everything went quite to plan. Painting the hair with the crown on top, he needed more space in the, in the, in the canvas, so we added another inch and a half or two inches onto the top of the canvas. So originally she didn't have a diadem well, at she all? Always, this was always the, the pose of the Queen, but in the painting it didn't fit. There's also that, you know, when does it become a royal portrait or just a straight portrait without the diadem and the tiara? Well, it helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's where it becomes fascinating, because a monarch, a Queen, becomes so bound up with a nation's identity, yeah, yeah. she becomes almost symbolic. Well, maybe that's why he needed the extra bit of canvas with the diadem. You yeah. know, it's sort of those two ideas. That bit, the crown, is the symbolic monarchy bit. Yeah, yeah. The bit underneath is the it's real person. person yeah. yeah, it's breathing and living like all of us. People were critical of this yeah, when, yeah. when it came out, partly because they felt that this was not a slap in the face, but that it was quite brutal. Was he conscious of what was no. being said? Did he um, care? He didn't care. I mean, he was aware that there's a certain criticism against, his, against this portrait, but he felt, you know, he couldn't do anything about that. That's... 
It's what other people thought. It's not what he was thinking. And what do you think? I think it's a serious, very good painting that, that shows the monarch in the 21st century. You know, it's not eight foot portraiture that's, uh, you know, glorifying the, the great and the good. This is a, a very real person in a unique position that, that Lisa is very aware of the history that's gone through her family. Controversy didn't begin with Elizabeth II. When it comes to making portraits, female monarchs offer some of the trickiest challenges of all, proven especially explosive and controversial combination. The royal portrait as we know it starts 500 years ago, not with a queen, but a king. In England, at the time of Henry VIII, the idea of a regnant queen was unthinkable. Women were simply considered unfit to rule. Henry VIII didn't have a male heir because 20 years of marriage to Catherine of Aragon had so far only yielded a daughter, Mary. So he was desperate to marry a younger woman. The thing was, the Pope refused to annul his marriage. So Henry's dynasty was in crisis. His solution was radical. Break with Rome and declare himself the supreme head of the Church of England. Henry would replace the Pope. It was a shocking and audacious move, and Henry had to assert his own legitimacy as well as his authority over the church. And to do that, he needed to develop some propaganda. And his secret weapon was the artist, Hans Holbein. By 1536, Holbein had become the king's painter and stayed with him for the rest of his life. Holbein's most powerful portrait of Henry VIII no longer exists because it was destroyed in a fire in 1698. But I think it's a testament to the artist's genius that more than 300 years later, it lives on as the definitive image of the Tudor king. The original Whitehall mural was huge, but a small version still exists, and it's currently here at the Maritime Museum in Greenwich. I'm going behind the scenes to try and understand the power of the original. The portrait was commissioned to celebrate the birth of a son and the assured future of the Tudor dynasty. What Holbein has created here is the archetype of kingship. Henry VIII is such an exaggerated idea of what the king could be, it's almost comic. He isn't anatomically correct. Look how broad he is, this big beast of a tyrant of a king. And just to ram home that point that he was capable of providing an heir for the nation, we see him in this sexually quite aggressive pose. And his codpiece is, frankly, enormous. And on the right, you can see the woman who's provided him with a son, Jane Seymour. She's painted in a very English tradition of how you present a queen consort. She's more passive than Henry. She doesn't look at us. Her arms aren't wide apart. Instead, they're clasped together demurely, just hovering above her stomach, above her womb signalling that she's fulfilled her function of providing an heir for the nation. And this image would be tremendously influential. People who saw it, this was the last word in royal portraiture. This was the, the benchmark of how you could summon a sense of monarchical authority. But that's very different if you're a ruling queen, if you're a queen regnant. They had to find a new way to present themselves that negotiated a middle path in between this and this. In 1553, his son, Edward VI, died, and Henry's daughter, Mary, became England's first queen regnant. She needed a royal portrait, but where on earth should she start? The answers lie deep in the National Archives, hidden in a dusty old box. Check this out. Is this the one we want? This is really exciting. This is genuinely a good oh. moment, is it? This is like, this is where you get excited every time, again and again, to be a historian. Are you excited to be a historian at the moment? Well, I am, but I don't know what I'm going to see. Well, exactly. That's all part of the fun. Good. We're gloved up. So we're gloved up, ready to go. And this is a document dating from 1553. So this isn't a colourful image, but it is an image that's incredibly powerful. It is, in fact, one of the first pictorial statements of female monarchy. We have here Mary pictured with the full regalia that a king would have worn. The orb and the scepter, the ermine gown, and in many ways, the significance of this picture is what's going on from the neck up. And she's got her hair loose. 
Now, is that significant? It is. You might just think that was the kind of you know fashion decision that she made that morning, but um, actually it's loaded with significance. Now, a queen consort traditionally would have had their hair down um, in advance of uh, the coronation that they would have with their um, with their husband. And what was the significance of that? Purity. Um, is it supposed to be I'm fertility? a young woman kind of thing? Yeah, in the same way that people would wear you know white bridal gowns now. And of course, the problem for Mary is. Well, she's not just queen consort, she's actually the reigning queen. So what does she do with her hair? <laughs> does she wear white and, in that sense, is dressed like a bride? Or does she wear the gown and the ermine, the purple velvet gown that a male monarch would be? So, in a way, really early on, it's quite crude, the imagery. They're just saying, oh, God, what do we do? We've got a queen. We'll just make her look like a king and she's got long hair because she has to, because she's a woman. Yeah, so it's assertive, but it's ambiguous, I guess. And that's exactly the kind of problem that um, Mary and those around her are facing. A year later, Mary married the heir to the mighty Habsburg Empire, the future Philip II of Spain. She doesn't look at all happy. Well, she's not happy. I mean, she's maybe staring at him like, you're just kind of on my patch. They're not kind of honeymoon portraits, are they? But this is Mary, and she's in the dominant position of the Queen, of the Queen Regnant. Philip is in the position of the consort. But the very interesting thing here is the floating crown above and between them. And if I was an Englishman at the time, I would begin to feel a bit angry after the wedding. Then, let me show you this. This is exciting. What do you think I'm going to show you? <laughs> I think Philip's going to take over. You think he's going to take over? That's my guess. Well, let's see. You tell me. Look at that. Read the portrait for me. He's in the dominant position on, as we look, the left. Mary's, by this point, looking... Well, she's lost the, the blue of youth, hasn't yes. she? Then? There is still the floating crown, but that sword is clearly much bigger and uh, more powerful than this scepter. And this is really big stuff. Suddenly, Philip has changed sides. I mean, what the hell's going on? Who was truly wielding power? Mary or Philip? Perhaps the clue lies in a famous image of Mary commissioned by her father-in-law, Charles of Spain, in 1554. The original was by Antonis More, and this is one of the surviving copies. The important thing about this portrait is less Mary's pale and slightly insipid face and more that extravagant jewel that she's wearing on her breast that was part of a gift that was given to her by Philip in the summer of 1554, shortly before they got married. So right there in the heart of the image is an emblem of the Habsburg dynasty. Even the pose refers to the Habsburgs because it's reminiscent of a very famous seated pose in familiar portraits by Titian of Philip's mother, Isabella of Portugal. Here you have Mary, the first regnant queen in English history, and rather than looking like a sovereign, she looks like a consort of an entirely different European dynasty altogether. She's been relegated from her status as a queen to that of a bride. Mary's marriage was a political necessity, but it limited her power and her portraits. It was left to her successor to pick up from where she left off. Of all the paintings of queens, it's those of Elizabeth I that truly capture the imagination. The Ditchley portrait by Marcus Gerert the Younger is one of the most famous of all. In it, she's Gloriana, the eternally youthful virgin queen. The thing about this painting is quite how remarkably strange it really is, because it was painted towards the end of Elizabeth's life in 1592, and she's standing in this supernatural kind of cosmic space with her realm literally laid out at her feet. So she is, compared with the kingdom, colossal. She's in this strange area where she has the elements at her command. There's sunlight to the left, and then there's a thunderstorm, and she can command both. She can summon sunlight, she can banish tempests as she wishes. As a piece of propaganda, obviously, this is very powerful indeed. It's really effective, but it's also something else. It's all it's odd and it's quite new. She's something dazzling and terrifying. And this portrait did a huge amount to completely reinvent how you go about painting a queen. Forty years earlier, there was little hint of what was to come. Aged 14, she's depicted as a young, bookish princess. Pale, cautious and actually quite sweet. In 1558, when she was 25, Elizabeth became England's first Protestant queen. Every move scrutinised by powerful Catholic enemies. 
She knew they were biding their time, and the threat of her rival, Mary Queen of Scots, loomed large. Elizabeth needed a strong royal portrait to restore stability and shore up her own power. And she, of course, knew from her sister that the Queen's image could all too easily escape her control. Unlike her father, Henry VIII, Elizabeth didn't have an artist who was up to the job. There are a number of artists who are producing images which don't show a regal-looking monarch. And you've got a difficult problem if you're an unmarried young woman who's taken the throne. Well, very early on in her reign, in the 1560s, we know that her ministers are really quite an anxious about this and concerned about it. So they were on the hunt for a really good court Absolutely. artist? yes. Six years into her reign, Elizabeth's advisers drafted a proclamation designed to regulate her image. No one could make a portrait of the Queen until that special artist could be found. I mean, they're really quite covetable things. You're you, telling me. You want to, to hold them to... Can I hold it? You, I'm not going to give you this to hold because it's, it's just so incredibly precious. You can see it very kind of close up. The miniature was created by Nicholas Hilliard, a goldsmith and painter. We'll get a, a better look at it if we put it under this microscope, which gives you an amazing view of the Queen's face, the background, the inscription, um, and the way that he painted her hair and her jewels and the costume. This gives you a real sense of how breathtaking the skill required to make an image like this is. Hugely skilled, yeah. I mean, he's a really, really impressive painter. Elizabeth had found her special painter. Hilliard's miniature became an official image. It was to have enormous influence on dozens of subsequent artists. This one's called the Phoenix, and this one's called the Pelican, and this is after the jewels that she wears at her chest. Um, and they're two images that are very, very closely related by the same artist. And if you look at the face patterns on these, they're actually identical, but reversed. So this is the same image as this is. Tanya's team had a theory that both portraits and many others all derived from the same source, Hilliard's miniature. This is a tracing of that painting. And if we put it against a scaled up version of the miniature, you can begin to see the close relationship between the miniature and the painting because the lips, the nose, and just about the eyes match up and the hairline matches up. That's a good yeah. fit. I mean, does that to you that feel conclusive that there's one source for the two images, it or does. the three images? It absolutely does, yeah. And that we've ended up with other images which um, use this face pattern again and again and again. The research proves that Hilliard was one of the first artists to be officially sanctioned by the Queen. His face pattern could be disseminated to other painters to copy. It allowed Elizabeth unprecedented control of her image. Her face wasn't the only thing she tried to control in her portraits. Like her father, Elizabeth was obsessed with another aspect of her image, clothes. Thanks. Thanks. I'm at Angel's Costumiers to meet costume historian Judith Watt. It's beautiful. God, that's nice. I think you're going to recognise this lot. Oh, yes, <laughs> I see. Yes, they oh. are. Production down here of the painting, so you can compare the two. Yeah, well, it's nothing like, is it? No. <laughs> I mean, if you look at this, her reticella lace. To what make what it type more of lace? Reticella. And what does that mean? The reticella is this cutwork lace that was imported from Italy. This was essentially extremely expensive and extremely stately, and this is about formality and status, outdressing everybody else, because, of course, in 1579, she brought in further, further sumptuary legislation, uh, regulating exactly what people could wear. So she was always wearing stuff that nobody else could. So this is a painting which has worked, hasn't it, because it's come down in history. It has commemorated her. We're excited about it. Yeah. Elizabeth remained unmarried and didn't produce an heir. She turned this weakness to her advantage and reinvented herself as the Virgin Queen. Why was it important she was seen as a virgin queen? Because she was filling the vacuum left by the, by the Reformation, whereby you did not find images of the Virgin Mary around in, in people's homes in every single church. That was the, a huge change. The English had been praying to the Virgin Mary for, you know, what, 
a thousand years, basically, hadn't they? I mean, there weren't any nuns left. Who was going to be the mother? This one. The mother of the people. I think that's fascinating because yes. if you think about the Reformation previously, yes. everywhere in England there would be images of... That was disappeared overnight. Gone. Absolutely. So she can play yes. that role. In Absolutely. It was a brilliant piece of PR. I mean, she was worth worshipping. That's my opinion. I think hmm. she was a great monarch. The Ditchley isn't your favourite one, is it? God, no. I don't know why. I think the Ditchley one's oh, brilliant. Oh, it's magnificent, but that dress is really boring. I, I, I find it too. Well, you're pulling out a, a black dress in yeah, comparison. Yeah, well, tell me about this one, then. OK, so this is the sieve painting um, of Elizabeth in the 1580s, early, early 1580s. She's got jewels in her hair, pearls, of course, the symbol of chastity, and, of course, the sieve here, which is a symbol of virginity. This um, cape here um, going around her is a kind of mask costume, so it's fancy dress. So, ergo, she's dressed as a vestal virgin from ancient Rome. So that is the story that goes with it. So this idea of costume, which we mm. see in several of the portraits, almost makes explicit this idea of performance. For Elizabeth, clothes were a form of performance. They're a form of in getting painting, a message across. Absolutely. In paintings, they absolutely weren't. This is about communicating her image. The dress in these paintings is about delivering a message. Elizabeth had developed powerful skills of propaganda. In the last years of her reign, they'd be put to the test. As Elizabeth approached old age, plots against her became more frequent and more bizarre. Bibles were laced with poison. Saddles became toxic booby traps. The need for a strong, powerful image became a matter of life and death. During the Tudor period, being 60 and being a woman was considered unnatural and abhorrent. And the thing is, if you were a monarch, it was something else altogether. It was also risky, because a weak and feeble body meant a weak ruler and a feeble nation. So Elizabeth had to come up with quite a crude but effective solution to the problem, which was she just started pretending that she wasn't getting older at all. Hilliard was called upon to sh** reality and create a new face pattern, the Mask of Youth. As she approached the age of 70, the face of the balding, toothless queen was frozen into that of youthful beauty. The government called for unauthorised images of the queen to be destroyed. Gloria, Gloria. Gloria, Gloria. It clearly worked. Elizabeth survived, reigning for 44 years. 500 years later, we're still enthralled to this virgin queen. Elizabeth I died in 1603, aged 70, and for nearly 100 years no other queen regnant ruled over England until Mary madness and all the strangeness of Elizabeth's Ditchley portrait. The way that Mary had herself represented was just astonishingly conventional and formulaic. You could even say that she set the representation of queens right back to the beginning. In 1688, King James II had alienated the nation with his unpopular Catholic policies. Parliament wanted him out and invited his Protestant daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange to start a glorious revolution. It succeeded, but opinion was divided on who should rule. Should it be Mary, the daughter of James II, or should it be her husband and first cousin, William, who had a huge army but was a Dutchman, possibly homosexual, and could only claim to be fourth in line to the throne? In the end, Parliament chose both. The idea was to combine Mary's legitimacy with William's military might. William would take the administrative power. Aside from that, it sounded reasonably egalitarian. But the portraits tell a very different story. As the leader of a violent and bloody revolution, William was surrounded by enemies. He needed propaganda on an epic scale. To stress his legitimacy, he borrowed heavily from portraits of his ancestor, Charles I. It's your classic way of painting a king. William is in the center. The whole point of an equestrian portrait is you see the monarch, or in the past, the Roman emperor, in full control, and he's trampling these symbols of war. To the left, you can see Neptune. Of course, he's a very powerful god, but he looks here like a slightly faded, feeble, weakling presence compared to the star of the show, William himself. 
The whole message of this is a full-blown Baroque composition in which we're supposed to marvel at William's imperial prowess, at his might, at his strength, traditional masculine values associated with a monarch. In Mary's portrait, we're asked to marvel at something else entirely. This is a portrait of Mary, not when she was queen, but when she was Princess of Orange. And I look at it and feel a little bit sad, actually, because it's so deliberately confining about what women in the late 17th century could be. It's almost as though she's decked out in this kind of straitjacket of convention. There are all of these tropes and motifs, cliches, if you like, of what it means to be a woman. You have to be alluring. You have to be attractive. So we can see rosy cheeks, bright red lips, come hither eyes. Even in the background, the garland of flowers, as though she herself is another succulent bloom, something that will one day produce children. Here's a future Queen of England, court. To see what I mean, you just need to look at this, another very glamorous portrait of an aristocratic lady, which has got all of the same tropes and motifs and ideas, which is essentially about aristocratic women as sexy, almost merchandise. This image of Mary remains the template by which she was painted throughout the rest of her life. From her coronation until her death at the age of 32, Mary was celebrated in portraits for little more than her beauty. Her successor, her ungainly younger sister, didn't even have that. So I reckon that most people would be hard-pressed to name this lady, Queen Anne. The thing about Anne is that she has a very bad reputation. Anne's contemporaries noted that she was dull and dim-witted, but her appearance caused abject horror. Obese and notoriously plain, she had a weeping eye and a squint. She was supposedly so ridden with gout that she couldn't even make it to her own coronation. She had to be carried to the ceremony. Let's have a look at this one. But the thing is, she ruled at the beginning of the 18th century. And this woman actually presided over one of the most exciting periods in our nation's history. The reign of Anne coincided with many great achievements. The empire expanded into Europe and America. Architecture flourished as John Vanbrugh built the Baroque masterpiece Blenheim Palace. And literature flowered with Alexander Pope writing his groundbreaking satire, The Rape of the Lock. While Anne presided over this era of innovation, history hasn't let her claim the credit. It seems her propaganda machine wasn't in the best of shape. In Anne's coronation portrait, she sought to align herself with Elizabeth I, dressing in gold. While Elizabeth was a resplendent virgin queen, the paintings of Anne are remarkably unflattering. And even worse, they're boring. Why is Queen Anne's portraiture so seemingly dull, unglamorous and conventional? Physically, she didn't, um, I think, look as she might have wanted. Well, so you think she was anxious about that? Yeah, I think that there would be a, a, a real anxiety about portraying that sort of view as a, a queen to her subjects. It's a pretty photographic age, though. No one need know. <laughs> that, that's true, but I think um, although you want something that's idealised, you also want something that's believable. But it would have been so easy. Like when you're commissioning official court portraiture, it's supposed to be flattering. It really does seem like she was the visual equivalent of having cloth ears in not understanding that art is brilliant propaganda. When you consider the fact that people must have realised that there was a very real possibility they would inherit the throne. It seems for a queen, at least, beauty matters. I can't help wondering if, armed with a strong portrait celebrating her virtues, history might have treated Queen Anne with a little more respect. By the late 18th century, the Age of Enlightenment had transformed ideas about women. Queen Charlotte, the wife of King George III, was lauded for her command of culture and science. Yet despite all her many talents, in portraits, once again, it wasn't the Queen's intelligence that was celebrated. Charlotte was a great patron of the arts, as was her husband, who founded this place, the Royal Academy. The painter Johann Zoffany specialised in works that were refined, polished and elaborate. 
He was quickly spotted by the king and queen, and this painting was his first royal commission. I think rather cleverly, Zoffany offers a whopping great clue about how we should think of Charlotte herself, because if you look at the composition, her form and the colour of her dress is mirrored very clearly in this triangular whitish silverish dressing table to her side. So Zoffany is not stressing her power as a queen consort. Instead, he's stressing her femininity. So I would call the tone of the painting a piece of elegant sycophancy because it's really well done, but it is an official commission. Unfortunately for her, she wasn't always going to be depicted in such an alluring, elegant and beautiful manner. In reality, contemporaries thought Charlotte exceedingly plain and increasingly ugly. Unluckily, her reign coincided with the golden age of satire. This is a far cry from Zoffany. Look at her. She's a monster with snakes in her hair, sort long scaly, and her breasts are long, sagging, withered, like, like others. And she's protecting Pitt's private parts, because it was said of Pitt, who never married, he was stiff with everybody except the ladies. And so here is Charlotte protecting the Prime Minister, but not depicted in a tall, friendly way. And look how Charlotte is depicted again, with her ragged, jagged teeth. Very ugly. Very, very ugly, with a prominent nose. And this was a depiction of a queen um, that was never really popular. So she was fair game to satirise. Perfect game. But I'm intrigued about the novelty of suddenly the disrespect paid to a queen, which well, is yes, something if, new. If I think you had portrayed Elizabeth in the first in this way, or, or um, uh, Mary Tudor, uh, you would have been executed. Mm. No question about that. And you would have been executed twice. You would have done Henry VIII that way. <laughs> no trouble at all. Authority. So this is a reflection of diminished power um, for the Hanoverian crown. Yes, the Prime Minister of the day was a very, very important figure and the Cabinet was important. And slowly the power was being transferred to those people who had uh, elected mandate. Yet Charlotte was facing more than the loss of mere power. By the late 1780s, her life was at stake. Here is Louis the XVI executed in France. And here is the possibility of George III being executed. And here is Charlotte strung up on a lamppost with the Prime Minister in uh, St James's. So there were a number of crises threatening Britain at this oh, time. There were great crises. Yes. There was real possibility of revolution. All the crown heads in Europe were worried they were going to be guillotined. In France, the King and Queen had alienated their subjects with their overblown absolute monarchy. To survive, the British crown needed a new kind of image, as far away from this as possible. In 1789, Charlotte, still reeling from events in France and her husband's madness, was asked to sit for the artist Thomas Lawrence. Just 20 years old, this awkward young man offended her instantly. Lawrence had a problem on his hands. The Queen insisted on sitting for him while listening to her daughter read to her, but she appeared totally bored and grim-faced and a bit severe. So in a bid to enliven her expression, he asked, not unreasonably, if he could engage her in conversation. But Charlotte considered this a terrible presumption and she refused to sit for him again. It would take all of Lawrence's innate talent to transform his stony subject into someone who appeared animated and warm. To find out how he did it, I'm going behind the scenes at the National Gallery to meet Larry Keith, Director of Conservation. X-rays reveal Lawrence's charcoal drawing from the first and only sitting. I'll just move this up so you can see. I don't know whether you think it's fanciful, but she looks more bored in the X-ray, mm. and here she's a little bit more alive. I certainly agree that there's movement in the mouth and there's a bit of adjustment, particularly the contour of the upper lip, that could be consistent with what we know to be the difficulty he had getting a likeness that was uh, pleasing. It's interesting mm. knowing a little bit about mm. the sitting, and the X-ray allows us to see that transformation. The whole surface is animated and alive. Mm. And that's to do with the way he's actually putting paint down, as we can see. Yes, I think the X-ray, to me, suggests the way in which he uh, was able to add a bit of sparkle and to, to animate from that one sitting. Sparkle's a good word mm. for it. Yeah, absolutely. The thing that interests me about it is this kind of way that he could combine this amazingly expressive bravura brush handling and yet harness that within an image that, you know, was striving for an, a decorum appropriate to the, a portrait of the Queen. Every era has to decide where those boundaries lie. Um, it's certainly true that with their hairstyle, it seems. It is a bit mad, eh? <laughs> King George had missed the point. Thomas Lawrence was a genius. 
I find it unbelievable that someone who was only 20 created this because it's been painted with such assurance. There's such an enjoyment in the whole idea of using a brush and oil paints in the first place. But Lawrence has injected everything with this brilliant spirit of informality. Yes, there are the classic tropes and ingredients of good old fashioned royal portraiture, the big swag of drapery, the sense of a platform, but there's nothing overly grand here. The swag of drapery is just a curtain. She's not really sitting on an elaborate throne. It's just a very plain and simple chair. We're not in the presence of someone who's been allowed to rule by divine right. And if you think about when this was painted, suddenly the informality of the image makes sense because this dates from 1789. Think of what was going on in France. The Bastille had fallen. All of a sudden, if you were a queen, it was imperative that you didn't look overly extravagant and grand and regal and out of touch. In the last years of their reign, George and Charlotte not only kept their heads, the sober, pared-down monarchy won them new adoration from their people. Fifty years later, by the reign of their granddaughter, Victoria, the great monarchies of Europe were disappearing fast. Britain, dissenting voices were loudly questioning the very notion of royalty. Victoria took Charlotte's image of a humbled monarchy and ran with it. Queen Victoria was the first ruling female monarch whose children survived childhood. Unlike Charlotte, who was a consort, Victoria had to portray herself as both a mother and a ruler. It was quite a tricky path to negotiate, but Victoria turned that weakness into a strength. She realised that the role of mother is the one trump card a queen has over a king. One painting didn't just transform the idea of the queen, it delivered her image to a completely new audience. The royal family in 1846 by the German artist Franz Xaver Winterhalter. If I'm honest, it's not very fashionable to say you like a painting like this one. It's done in a very suave, quite cosmopolitan 19th century style. Technically, it's a virtuoso piece of painting. And to modernise almost feels a bit slick. But the thing is, I find this really charming. I think it's a wonderful composition because what we see isn't that old tradition of kings and queens in quite stiff, fusty outfits and positions. Rather, we have Victoria and Albert surrounded by their kids. She has her arm around the eldest, Bertie, the future Edward II. And then to the right, you have this really beautiful mini group within the larger group of three daughters. Quite a clever detail on Winterhalter's part is that there are seven people in the group. Only two of them look out directly at the viewer, Victoria and the infant. And subtly, Winterhalter is aligning those two protagonists. This is about a queen who's as much a mother as she is a monarch. The following year, the painting was displayed at St James's Palace. Lord Palmerston, the future Prime Minister, declared it the finest modern painting he'd ever seen. 100,000 visitors queued to see it. That was just the beginning. Thanks to the revolution in printing, the image would be mass-produced. These were very easy to obtain. There were some print shops that said that 70% of all the sales that they made were of images of Queen Victoria. And domesticity is the idea that the royal family are really trying to project here. Victoria was desperate to court an influential demographic, the middle class, newly furnished with the right to vote. In 1860, she gave permission for the first official set of royal photographs, specifically aimed at her new middle class fan base. When the first ones went on sale, 60,000 were sold just in the first couple of days. And the wholesale price was 3p a portrait. That isn't really very much, even in the 1860s. It's like you've invited the Queen into your home and she's there on the mantelpiece because these are not images of power. The royal family don't want to lord it at this stage. I think that they have reached the conclusion that ordinariness is the key to their survival. As Victoria's reign continued, she reached a new obstacle, her age. After Elizabeth I, no queen had lived beyond the age of 40 until Victoria. Perhaps the secret to her long life was her favourite tipple, scotch in her claret. <laughs> Cheers. It tastes good. I think it tastes good. <laughs> 
I mean, it's got, I mean, obviously, it's got a kick. It's, um... I mean, if you are a drunk, this is a good drink. She probably had one of these to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee. I think she had quite a few, and I think she had quite a few in general. Victoria didn't turn down a, a, a little drink. The Diamond Jubilee was a moment of celebration, but it was unsettling to see her age. The big problem, of course, that Victoria is getting so old, and people knew that, and they were panicking about what was going to happen when her son came to the throne. Was everything going to collapse? You know, was it going to be the end of what they'd known? And she was this great queen. She'd been on the throne for 60 years. By the end of her reign, she was so excited, but underneath it, the empire was crumbling. How could Britannia rule the waves if a quarter of its population lived in destitution? On the continent, Germany was growing ever stronger. The dominance of the empire was no longer assured. How do you show, most of all, that Britain has to be feared? That's the important thing. The rest of the world must still be terrified of Britain and its might. And this was a question that became increasingly greater, more important when she was old, because when you've seen photos of her, you can't really produce those lying Gloriana-type portraits that we have of, say, Elizabeth I, that knock a few years off her age. We can't have this airbrushing going on anymore. They can't diverge too much from what everyone knows she looks like, which is actually, by her older years, pretty plain and pretty cross, really. The last portrait of Queen Victoria is on display in her apartments at Kensington Palace. The artist Heinrich von Angeli deliberately presented her in old age. I find it quite tricky looking at the painting, though, because I don't see necessarily a woman who is radiating imperial virtues and strength and wisdom. I see someone who looks depressed. I think she looks even a little bored and glum in this picture. She's this big, dark mound of melancholy, really. And the whole message of the painting for me, is that it points out how tricky it is for an artist to reconcile painting a potent queen who's also very old. And I guess if she is meant to be the embodiment of empire, then what she represents is a kind of steadfastness. The fact that the empire is immovable and immutable. And perhaps, if you're anxious about Britain's future, you could take some heart from that. Over the next 50 years, the empire was to change beyond recognition. The Second World War saw Britain bankrupted and diminished, trailing behind America and the Soviet Union. Throughout, King George VI had proved a strong figurehead, inspiring enormous affection. His death at the age of only 56 brought the nation to a standstill. The new queen, Elizabeth II, was just 25. Those around her were deeply concerned by her lack of experience. The royal propaganda machine sprang into action. This is a very famous picture of Elizabeth on her coronation day, taken by the society photographer Cecil Beaton. This is a piece of patriarchy of old. Elizabeth is wearing the imperial state crown. She's decked out with jewels from every corner of the empire. If you look very closely, you can see the queen, the new queen is wearing these enormous drop pearl earrings. And those earrings actually once belonged to Queen Elizabeth I. He's trying to summon a vision of a new Elizabethan age. So as a piece of visual rhetoric, Beaton's photograph is extremely persuasive, but its DNA, its vocabulary, if you like, owes everything to the queens who preceded Elizabeth II. During the 50s, images of Queen Elizabeth presented her as a glamorous young woman who's nonetheless regal, formal and bejeweled. But youthful beauty could only take her so far. In 1966, the Queen visited Aberfan in Wales after a mining disaster had killed 144 people, mostly children. The Duke described the scene when he first visited the disaster area a week ago. It had taken her nine days to make the trip and the Queen was vilified for being remote and out of touch. Her image was out of step with the 60s, 
She needed to catch up. Well, you see the new era of informality in the photograph by Eve Arnold, and this is a really breezy, fresh, very beautiful Absolutely. image. This is, this is now the, the kind of imagery that, which seems a world away from the 1950s. It's not exactly a state occasion. It could almost be anybody. It could almost be a member of the public. This is a radical way of presenting the Queen in this much more literally down-to-earth fashion. It's a great photograph. I think there's another great photograph, which is just here, which is ah. my favourite one in the show, um, which is similar, similar tone, similar feel. And this is, well, it says it's, this was taken in 71. And where is she? She's actually on the, the Britannia. This is a photograph taken by Lord Litchfield. They're just crossing the equator, and the tradition is that you duck a member of the crew and soap them down. And that's what happened to Litchfield. He kind of expected it and had a waterproof camera at the ready. Really? And so when he bobbed up, he caught the Queen laughing spontaneously at this hilarious moment. I think what, what I love about it is that she looks so chic and glamorous. And I like just formally, I mean, it's a very sort of spare image behind, it's beautifully composed. I think she has very cool sunglasses, picked mm. up in the porthole, uh, there's a, uh, a lot going on. I think what this photograph really does is address the notion that queens have to be very serious and po-faced and rather glum figures, and all of that is consigned to history, and instead what you have is someone who is vivacious and enjoying themselves. But this new informality so what do we see in this picture? Here is the Queen visiting Princess Anne uh, in hospital for a routine gynaecological operation. It's nobody's business, really. And yet we see the Queen running the gauntlet of a phalanx of photojournalists all taking their photographs. And we now have this issue unfolding in the 1970s where there is a confusion between the public role of the Queen and her private life. The territory opened up by the media was exploited by a new faction, contemporary artists. Artists like Gerhard Richter based their work on newspaper cuttings. Richter's blurry surfaces evade our attempts to see the subject in focus. Can art, he asks, really capture the truth of a person? For Andy Warhol, the Queen became nothing but surface, her public face complete artifice. What we see increasingly through the course of uh, this exhibition and in the last 40 years is a tendency to hold the Queen's image up in a critical light and to pose questions about her relevance, her importance, and what she's for and what she's about and whether we need a Queen. All of these things are constantly coming through the images that we have of her. In days gone by, the Queen's predecessors might have retaliated with a strong royal portrait. Why are so many portraits of the Queen so exceedingly boring? Perhaps it's their sycophancy, creaky paintwork. Anthony Williams painted the Queen like an OAP with sausage fingers. The trouble with so many portraits of the Queen is that they're full of all of the regalia we associate with monarchy, crowns and jewels and cloaks, a sense of pageantry, but they don't quite acknowledge that those trappings today feel a bit odd and anachronistic. Contemporary artists have to conjure some of that pomp and splendour that accrues to a monarch, for sure, but they also have to reconcile that with a sense of someone real who exists, lives and breathes in the 21st century, and that is an enormous challenge. Thomas Struth is one of the leading contemporary artists of his age, photographing cities, families, and science labs with precise, almost forensic detail. He's certainly not known for taking on celebrity commissions. Can I ask you a little bit about what it's like to take on a royal commission like this? Is there a risk, as a contemporary artist taking on this commission, that you might lose credibility almost? I all the time. Uh, like us. But, yeah, like you. But, but in the end, I thought I cannot reject because it's such a, it, would, it would be such an unusual opportunity. Well, what was the appeal? Why did you say yes? It was a possibility to, yeah, to, to, uh, you, to, to enter the ring of this historical activity and see how far I can go or what my contribution uh, might possibly be. So from the beginning, very self-consciously, you're thinking about the whole tradition of royal portraiture and how this image might fit into that? Yes, of course, yeah. The photograph was taken on an old-fashioned medium-format camera, which gives a vast level of detail, even when the subject's life-size. I think this is a really, really fantastic 
piece, work of art, which you can't say of many, many royal portraits. I think so many of them are rubbish. I love this one, partly because it isn't overwhelmingly pompous and it isn't sycophantic and they feel separate from us and grand, but not too grand, mm -hmm. somehow approachable. You could look at them as parents, you could look at them as a representative of the generation. Uh, Grandparents? That, yeah, that they are and they are actually the same age as my parents. Well, so in a sense you've created a portrait, a sympathetic portrait of yeah. a generation that has had its time in a sense, yeah, but you're it's not it's brutally sort of removing that no, picture it's, at it's, all. I mean, it's, of course it's, a, it's also a strange situation here because Queen Elizabeth yeah, it is powerful, you're more foggy and less determined uh, manners than, than a queen or the kings of England have been before. So now it's a question of celebrity, fame, it's a very undefined energy. Warhol, all about surface in that sense. Yeah. You, much more about a sense of depth. In the end it's much more interesting you know, who, who these people really are. Did you try and reflect that in the picture? Yes, I think so. I reflect on that by, yeah, by showing them very real. So you see the legs of the queen with the you know, blood vessels and you see the neck and you see the hands and she doesn't look like a normal person because of, of the surrounding, but she looks you know, like a person who will die one day and, you know, and it's a kind of humble uh, portrait in a certain way. Perhaps by acknowledging the Queen's humanity, we can accept her elevated status. As usual with depicting a Queen, it's a difficult balancing act. Over 500 years, artists have had to negotiate power and femininity, reconciling the roles of virgin, mother and wife with being a monarch. In the 21st century, it's become even more complicated. We're more informal and thankfully today we no longer feel troubled by a woman ruling over us. And all of that means that contemporary artists now face a new challenge, which is how in the 21st century to go about making a convincing modern portrait, not necessarily of a queen, but of a monarch at all. A surprising profile of a mysterious figure in classical music here on the HD tomorrow evening with Delius, composer, lover, Enigma at 10. Next, though, it's an extra large helping of QI. <laughs>